this morning, my God is awesome. Protector. Sometimes we misunderstand that. But the word of God is going to help us out on this morning. Let us stand one more time. Psalms 51, written by King David, after he had messed up terribly. Tell your neighbor he messed up. up. Psalms 51, 1 and 2, it says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You may be seated. Do everything that you can on this morning to pay close attention to the word of God. For if you fail to pay attention, the results will still be the same. So if you block this message from your mind, the consequences will still be the same. So it behooves you to focus in on this morning so that you can understand the God whom you serve. For a subject on this morning, what happens when a Christian sins? What happened, I said, when a Christian sins? You are a Christian. You are on your way to heaven. Your salvation is secured. You have a heavenly home awaiting you. But what happens when a Christian sins? If we can't lose our salvation, does that mean we have nothing to lose when we sin? In this book, Psalm 51, We find the story of King David's sin. David committed a horrible, heinous, hurtful sin, yet he was still a child of God. How many of you are glad that you are a child of God? You know, I expect to meet David one day in heaven. He was, as the scripture says, a man after God's own heart. And yet, this man committed an awful, a terrible, a horrible sin. What we see is this. If a person is bound to sin, he is bound to suffer. He will not lose his salvation, but suffering, tell your neighbor suffering, follows sin as night follows day. So we're looking at this, and all of you may have read the story about David who committed a sin with a lady named Bathsheba. First of all, He was looking at another man's wife. I'm talking about the David in the Bible now. And he was the king, and he could have had any woman of his choice, but he decided to take another man's wife, and she got pregnant. How many of you know the story? And so he tried to cover his sin by having 
her husband come home from war, get him drunk, and have him sleep with his wife, and he would never know that the child wasn't his. But the man was loyal to David. He was loyal to the king. He was loyal to the country. He was loyal to God. And he would not go home while the other men were at battle. So David was in trouble here. So he decided to make things worse. You know, when you try to fix something or cover something up, you end up making it worse than it was in the beginning. So what he did was he gave Urias a note, sent him back to the front lines, and made sure that Urias was killed. And sure enough, Urias delivered the note and he was too loyal to peep inside the note. He gave the note to his commander, and the commander did as the king instructed. And sure enough, Urias was killed, and David thought, I got away with it now. So he went ahead and took Bathsheba in to his castle, but he forgot that God has an all-seeing eye. Do I have a few witnesses in here? I know you may be nervous when you hear this, but hang in here. But God saw where you was last night. God heard what you said. He, he read the text before you typed it in. He saw what you put on Facebook before you put it on Facebook. God is an all-seeing God, and he knows everything. So he sent his preacher by to confront David. So David was confronted by Nathan. And Nathan was afraid for his own life, for David was the king, and he was afraid that the king would have him killed. So Nathan told him a parable about a man, a poor man who only had one sheep. And the rich man took the, one, the, the, the poor man's only sheep and David said, where is that man? Bring him to me. And Nathan said, thou art the man. And this is where we are. David realized that God saw his sin. And so he writes this passage. So first we're going to look at, write this in on your sermon notes, consequences of sin in the life of a Christian. There are consequences to sin in a Christian's life. Write it in, consequences of sin in the life of a Christian. Now, I'm just going to take a little test. I'm just going to ask you a question. How many of us in here can testify that we are suffering the consequences of our sin. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you don't mind. Everybody in here should be able to testify that it is true. There are some consequences. Even though I'm a Christian and Jesus died for my sins, my sins still come with consequences. So first of all, Write this in, sin dirties the soul. Sin dirties the soul. What is the soul? The soul is the very essence of who you are. Your mind, your, your, your intellect, the real you. When you sin, you dirty your soul. David cried out in Psalms 51.2, Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Wash me, Lord. He wasn't talking about physical washing. Let me tell you something now. You go out and commit a sin, you can take 10 showers. Your sin is still on you. Some folk think they can wash it off. I'll just take a good bath, wash my hair, use a lot of soap and put some lotion in my hair and get this sin off me. Uh -huh. 
Well, the sin ain't on your physical body, it's in your soul. And only God can wash it off your soul. So David says, wash me, Lord. Cleanse me from my iniquity. If you have fallen short, this is your prayer. Wash me, Lord. Clean up my dirty mind. So it leads us to be sin dominates the mind. Let, let me tell you something now. You can't erase sin from your mind. Folk figure, I'm just going to go on and put it in the past. I'm not going to think about it. Well, it's not that easy to get rid of. Do I have a witness in here? You can go around pretending it didn't happen, but you know deep in your mind it happened. Tell your neighbor it happened. You might as well accept it. You might as well admit it. He says, look at David admitting it. He says, for I acknowledge. Come on now, that's where we got to go. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always, tell your neighbor always, always, always before me. I can't get rid of it. I can't hide it. I might as well accept it and acknowledge that yes, I did it. I did it, I did it, I did it, I'm guilty. That's where you got to go with God now because God already know you did it, right? You can't hide it from God, but you can't even hide it from folk. Folk know you did it too. Uh, see, elder folk, uh, uh, my mother was uh, telling me the other day, she was married to my dad, and uh, she was sitting down with my grandma LT, and my grandma LT said, baby, uh, how many months are you? And, and mama said, what? How many, what am I? But the older folk can see something. They could sense something. They knew she was pregnant. She didn't even know, but mama knew. I mean, you understand, you can't hide your sin from any folk. They can see it in your eye. Do I have a witness? Get that guilt follows you. You don't walk the same. Uh, when I taught school, I can tell when the little girls messed up because they became equal to Mr. V now. They asked me, who do you think you talking to? I say, excuse me, boo. She's grown now because she's went out and done something she had no business doing. Now she's not feeling like a little girl any longer. She's a woman now. You will have a few witnesses in here. The test of your salvation is not if you can sin, but if you can sin and ignore it. I know I'm saved because my sin bothers me. Do I have a few witnesses in here? Oh, listen now. If you can sleep good at night, perhaps you're not saved. But anybody who is a Christian, sin is not that easy any longer. It's going to bother you until you go back to God and repent of that thing. You can't continue, the scripture says, in sin once you've come to the Lord. You become very uncomfortable. Yes, sir. Do I have two witnesses in here? You become very uneasy now. There was a time you can cuss folk out and sleep good at night, but you can't do it no more. Sin dominates the mind. Not only that, let's look at C. Sin disgraces the Lord. Sin disgraces the Lord. Listen to me well. You can't flatter God. You can't come in here and raise your hands before God and give him the praise. As some of them say, and I'm... I'm into my praise. Well, who are you praising, yourself or God? Sin disgraces God. My brothers and sisters, God is not only monitoring you at the 1030 service. 
How many of you know God see you 24-7? So you can't come in here and, and, and deceive the Lord by coming in here, giving all your praise and lifting them up, but your life does not line up with your praise. No, sir. Do I have two witnesses to, to, to understand that what you're praising and what you're claiming in here, you've got to live it out there. David realized, he said, against you, you only have I sinned. Somebody said, well, what about Bathsheba? Uh, what about all his children? Well, it, it begins with God. See, when you sin against God, that's repercussions now. Do I have a few witnesses in here? Oh, that's just the waves rolling after. It begins with your decision to cross the line with God. So all the folk get hurt as a result of your sin against God. David said, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. You're right, God. I'm wrong. You saw me. You taught me. You warned me. You told me in advance. And I did it anyway. Just a few hands of folk who did it anyway. Come on now, come on. Not just your pastor. I know all of y'all. Who did it anyhow? And now we're suffering the consequences and our family members are suffering the repercussions of what we've done against God. Sin disgraces God. Uh, write this note in. Sin is a direct affront to Almighty God. Sin is a direct affront to Almighty God. So let me ask you a question. Where can you sin that God don't see you? Does anybody know a special spot in town where you can go and nobody sees? Nobody know you're there? Anybody know a special spot on the lakefront where nobody will see you? Anybody been to City Park back deep in the woods somewhere and nobody was there, you thought? I ask you again, where can you go? Can you go to another state? Uh, can you go to a special hotel? Can you go outside the country and God ain't there? Where can you sin that God don't see you? So my brothers and sisters, the next time you get ready to sin, speak to the Lord. Say, hello, Lord. I'm about to do a great evil. I'm glad you're here. I guarantee when you speak to the Lord, and he, he's going to speak back, he's going to say, don't do it. The heart of God being broken hurts the sinner more than the punishment. I had five children and some of them I had to use a belt and some others I, I didn't have to use a belt. Brittany was one of them. Uh, I could just be angry with Brittany and she'll, she'll cry. That's all it took. Just, Brittany, what did you do? <laughs> I didn't even take the belt off yet. But she was broken because my heart was broken and that brought her to tears and that brought her to repentance. But then that was Reginald. It took a little more for him. Do I have a witness? It took a lot for Peter. And let's not bring up Nicole. I still have to whip her. I have to ask Brandon first. And Jen is my baby. 
Let's look at D. Sin depresses the heart. Come on now, a lot of y'all depressed right now. You say, I'm so depressed. Sin got you depressed. See, let, let me tell you, when you walk with God, that ain't nothing but joy. Yeah. You can't walk with God and be depressed. No. Uh, how can you walk with a millionaire and be depressed? Yeah. I can't walk with Bill Gates and hang out with Bill Gates and Bill Gates telling me everywhere we go, I got it, Rev. I'm going to be depressed. I can't get depressed. Uh, I'm with Bill Gates. Sin, when you walk with sin, Sin keeps you depressed. Some of you don't know, you just got to give it up. That's why you're down. That's why, you're, that's why your heart hurting all the time. Give sin up. Divorce yourself from sin. David said, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Note one, write this in. When we sin, I don't know if that's on there. Did we put that on there? We have no joy nor gladness. You're never going to be happy. Somebody waiting to get happy first. You got to give up sin first. If you're thinking it's going to get better, you're deceiving yourself. I'm going to live with my man and, and, and we, one day we're going to be happy. No, you're not going to ever be happy. God's not going to bring his joy in a sinful situation. He's not going to bring joy in that situation. You've got to choose to do it his way and then joy follows. Some of you are depressed for no reason. You've got to give sin. Sin depressing. Note number two about that. Sin seems like a good idea at first. Do I have a witness in here? It seems like the right thing to do. But look at Proverbs 20, 17. It says, bread or earnings or whatever, bread gained by deceit. I'm going to steal a television and sell it and, and make me some money. That's not making money. That's deceit. Bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man. But afterward, tell your neighbor that's going to be afterward now. His mouth will be filled with gravel. You're going to regret that sinful decision. Y'all hear me preaching to you? Restore, David said, to me the joy of your salvation. Note number three. The most miserable person on earth is not lost folk. A person lost don't know they're miserable. They think they're happy. You look at them and you think they're happy too. They're on their fourth wife. And you say, look how happy they are. Them folk don't know what happy is when they see it. So they, they, they appear not to be miserable, right? The most miserable person is the saved person who is out of fellowship with God. That's miserable. You're depressed. You're upset. You're aggravated. You just can't get right. You can't feel right. Do I have a witness in here? Because you're out of fellowship with your creator. Note three, write this in. That's the same one, right? I'm sorry, excuse me. What is in you this morning? Come on, you got to ask yourself. Joy or something else? What's in you? How are you feeling this morning? Are you joyful or are you depressed? 
Somebody said, you know something? You full of hell. That's your problem. When you're full of hell, you're sinful. You're living a sinful life. And, and, and you, you can't think straight because you got too much of hell living inside of you. And let me tell you something now. Happiness is not joy. Happiness depends on your situation. And situations change, do I have a witness? So happiness is not what we're talking about. We're talking about the joy of the Lord, and it won't matter what situation you find yourself in. When you're walking with God, you're all right. Let's move on. E, sin diseases the body. Sin makes you sick. Sin ultimately wants to kill you. Y'all need to know the end thereof, the scripture says, is death. Separation from. Sin makes you sick. Sin will stress you out. Sin will make you go crazy. Do I have a witness in here? How many of y'all know some crazy folk? Raise your hand. Y'all know? How many of y'all know some? How many of y'all got crazy folk in your family? Yeah, because it's you. Yeah, that's. I know you know them. You see them every day. You know who it is. Come on, tell the truth. You, know. you wake up and look at that crazy folk every morning, right? How many of you looked in the mirror and said, you know you crazy? Sin does that to you. It diseases the body. Look at Psalms 58, 51 and 8. It says, make me hear joy and gladness th that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Let me tell you something. God loves you so much, he might have to break you down. Listen to me, a Christian, you, you don't understand. When you sin, God may have to step in and say, let me slow you down. A good parent, a good parent, now we don't have good parents no more. A good parent know how to slow a child down. Uh, anybody, parents say, you've gone too far. Come on in here, I got to slow you down. And let me tell you something, slowing the child down ain't talking about go sit in the corner over there. That don't slow them down. You got to do it God's way. Spare the rod. Spoil. Do I have a few witnesses in here? The child, you got to change their mind with a stimulus package. Anybody got a stimulus package in their home? Uh, and you may even send the child to go pick up the package. Go to the closet over there and get my special package and let me stimuli you. Let me get you back where you should be. Let me tell you something. God will allow sin to slow you down. That comes with sin. Sickness. sickness. Some of us ignore the doctor's orders. Do I have a witness in here? But uh, the doctor don't have to worry. He can just wait. Do I have a witness in here? Doc say take two of these at nine o'clock. Take one of these at twelve. I ain't taking nothing. Well, your sin We'll catch up with you. Sin diseases the body. Uh, my brothers and sisters, you need to understand that we can't afford. Look at, look at the next slide. It says, a merry heart does good like medicine. But a broken spirit dries the bones. Right there in the Bible. Proverbs 17, 22. Note one, write this. Joy works like medicine. Misery works like poison. 
Anybody had a dose of poison on last night? Her name might have been Sheila. Or Henry, ladies. A dose of poison. May be named liar. Fornicator. Murderer. A dose of poison. Will wipe you out. Anybody ever sprayed a roach with a dose of poison? He may walk straight for three more steps. Didn't do nothing to me. Do I have a witness in here? But keep your eye on him. After a while, that boy's going to start staggering a little bit. He's going to still try to climb the wall. Go in places you don't want him to be. He's going to still try. But after a while, he's going to say, oh. Do I have a few witnesses? Yes, poison. Sin is poison, and it destroys the soul, the mind, and the body. Yes, Note two, write this in. Psychosomatic illness. Psychosomatic illness. This is a true illness. Psycho means mind, soma, body. Sometimes you go to the doctor and the doctor says, I don't, I don't see nothing wrong. Maybe you're stressed out. But see, you need to bring the pastor with you to the doctor. I said, no, doc, they sinful. <laughs> it's sin, doc. It ain't, it ain't nothing. It's, it, they live in a life of sin. They're walking contrary to the will of God and it's making them sick. Psychosomatic illness. Walking against your creator. Walking against his will and you're losing your mind and it's causing you to be sick. Let's look at food. Psychosomatic illness. We eat when we're not even hungry. Do I have two witnesses in here? Somebody thinking about a sandwich right now. You ain't hungry. Somebody hungry right now, but your stomach is full. Your stomach say, don't eat no more. But your messed up mind says, these ribs are good. And I'm going to eat them all because somebody else might get them. All in your mind. Then you begin to swear, I'm hungry. I'm starving. Just ate now. I'm about to faint. Psychosomatic. Do I have three witnesses in here? Sickness in the mind. I got to have him. Girl, he's married. I got to have him, girl. I, got, I can't live without him. Messed up mind. I need some drugs. I can't relax. Isn't it funny? The same person who can't relax when they put you in the jail cell. You in there quoting scripture, the Lord is good. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You become a Bible scholar. Psycho. Ask your neighbor, are you psycho? Look at the next one. Sin. Come on now. Don't be scared to ask them. They already know they psycho. Just ask them. Just humor them. They know. Look at F. Sin defiles the spirit. Your spirit is quickened by God. Your spirit receives the word of God. 
When you come to Bible class, when you come and sit under preaching, it's your spirit that's paying attention. Your spirit hears from God and your spirit develops your mind. David said, create in me. Come on now, y'all with me? Come on, what I need? A what? A clean home. Oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Help me, Lord, where I can't help myself. Fix me, Lord, where I am broken so I can cultivate my mind. So I can finally get it right. My spirit is defiled. And it's because of sin. Sin has defiled my mind. And G, come on, write this in. Sin destroys the testimony. I am, as a believer, called by God to be a witness. All of us who are believers are to testify to the world of the goodness of Jesus Christ. But how can I testify if I'm living like the world? I don't know y'all don't hear me now. Oh, it's hard for me to save a brother if I'm living the same way he is. And my sin destroys my testimony. Look at 14, it says, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. I killed Urias. I murdered the man. Oh God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Don't, be, don't misunderstand me now. It's not about your righteousness. You're singing loud about God's righteousness. And God is so righteous and God has had such an impact on my life that it caused me to give up sin and testify of God's righteousness. Look at 15. It says, oh Lord, open my lips. Oh, let me tell you something. Sometimes I, I, I worry about some of you when we come in God's house. Some of us just, just won't praise God. But it's sin that's keeping your mouth shut. Oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. You can't live a life of sin and praise God at the same time. You got to make a choice. You got to put sin behind you. Do I have a few witnesses in here? When we sin, we cannot witness. Look at 51, 12, and 3. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then, tell your neighbor then. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted. To you. So let's let's do a little short review of this consequences. Let's see if we got it. First, A, sin does what? Dirty is the what? B, sin does what? C, sin does what? D, sin does what? E, sin does what? Come on. F, sin does what? And G, sin does what? That's what it does. Now, so we know that we've got to do something about this. We need some help because we can't do it of our own strength. We need God to do it. We've got to surrender now and give ourselves to God and say, God, fix me. Clean me up. So the second part of our sermon, let's write this in. Cleansing of sin in the life of a Christian. How can I get myself right with God? I need to get right with God. How can I get right now? I've messed up. 
I'm in a bad situation. How can I get this right? Well, let's listen to David again. Uh, first of all, you need the confidence. Your confidence must be placed in God. I think you just need to check that off. Confidence. Check it off. I need confidence, not in myself. I need confidence in someone else. Let's look at it. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your. Come on now, let's get it right. According to what, church? Your love and kindness. According to the multitude of your tender Blot out, only God can do it now. Blot out my transgressions. How many of y'all glad God blotted it out? Come on, now this is what we shout about. Somebody want a new sofa to shout over. Somebody want a new car to shout over. But you ought to be shouting because he blotted out your sins. How many of you know the new car is still going to be here when you're gone? The sofa, somebody else is going to sit on it, right? It's still going to be here. You need to thank God for blocking out your sins. So you need confidence in God. Note this, write this in. God does not love us because we are valuable. We are valuable because God loves us. Now listen to me now. Don't get it twisted. Don't think you can impress God. And, and, and uh, look at yourself and think more of yourself than you ought, the scripture said. God don't love you because you are valuable. We are valuable because God loves us. That makes you something because of how God feels about you. Scripture says, while you were yet sinners, he died for you. You wasn't valuable. You wasn't worth anything. But his love for you made you valuable. God demonstrates his own love. That's right there in Romans 5 and 8. God demonstrates. He, he shows his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died that should be for us. Confidence. Note number two. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any less. It's like a mother's love. A mother will love her child regardless. There's nothing you can do to increase the value of her love for you. She loves you from day one. She, it doesn't matter if you live a life of crime. Mama still loves you. She will be the only one still there. When everybody know you're guilty and everybody know you've done it and everybody know you're done, Mama still will say, I love you, baby. That's how God is. God loves you regardless of what you do or what you don't do. He still has the same amount of love for all of you. Do I have a witness in here? None of us are any better than the next believer. God loves all of his believers the same way. Do I have a witness in here? Those who go to church, those who don't go to church, he still loves them the same. He loves all of his creation. The scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth upon him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He loves you all. So you ought to be confident. Secondly, confession. Now this is the part where we don't like to participate. But with God, you got to confess your sins. Somebody say, he already know I did it. But he wants you to confess it. Confess it. Own it. If you want him to fix it, own it. Uh -huh. Look at David again in 51, 2 and 3. It says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, my sin. 
and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Y'all see all those personal pronouns? Somebody said, oh, it's because of her. I did it because he provoked me. If my daddy would have been home, none of this wouldn't have happened. It's my sin. How many of y'all own your sin now? Oh, we We don't like pointing to ourselves, do we? I'm going to ask y'all again, how many of y'all own your own sin? If my pastor would have preached about it, <laughs> my iniquity, that's what you got to tell the Lord. It's me, Lord. It's me standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, not my father, not my mother. It's me. Anybody got there yet? Listen to me now. When you die, Tell your neighbor, and you will. When you face God, you got to face him by yourself. You've got to answer for yourself. You might as well develop that relationship right now. Note one, write this down, confession. Confession is not just mere admission. Come on now, let's understand what's saying. What's saying here? Just admitting it is not confession. Come on now. Wake up. Pay attention. Just admitting you've done it is not enough. If we confess our sins, if we do what? Confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, when you confess your sin to God, he's not going to leave you in that situation. If you confess, he's going to do something about it. But you've got to confess it. So what is confessing? Confessing is not just admitting. So what is confessing? Let's look at note two. Confess comes from uh, the word homos and lego. In other words, it means to say the same thing. Confess means to say the same thing. Confess is to say, God, you're right and I was wrong. God, I agree with you. My fornication is wrong. My lying is wrong. My backbiting is wrong. My stealing is wrong. I agree with God. Now, that doesn't always come instantly. It takes folks some time to agree with God. Sometimes you got to go through it to find out that, yes, God was right. Do I have a few hard-headed folk know what I'm talking about? Some folk that had to experience it first, and then you said the same thing. Confession, look at David here. David knew that adultery was wrong, but he did it anyway, and now here he is realizing y'all realize your sin was wrong now this is true confession see when you admit it you go out and do it again I'm going to say that slower when you just admit your sin you go right back and do it again anybody been burnt by fire before raise your hand anybody got burnt you confessed that thing didn't you you confess that fire is hot. See, if you would have just admitted fire is hot, you go try it again. But when you get burned, hello, somebody, some of y'all got to wait to get burned. I'll wait with you. Confess means to say the same thing. When you pray, go 
don't just admit your sins to God in your prayer. Lord, I told a lie today. Forgive me, Lord. Lord, I said a cuss word. Forgive me, Lord. That's admission. Confession, your heart feels different about it. You're convinced that I'm not ever. Anybody got there yet? Doing that thing. Now, listen to me now. God's going to get you there. It's going to be painful. Tears will come from your eyes. Your heart will be broken. But you will realize that sin is nothing to play with. God's going to get you there. It takes some of us a long time. But you will realize why he died the way he died. He died a terrible death because sin is a horrible thing. Who is quiet? What every Christian ought to know. Somebody said, if I'd have known he was preaching that. Note number three. Accusation versus conviction. Now get the difference here. Pay attention. After you have confessed your sins does not mean you won't hear about it again. Listen to me say it again. After you have confessed your sins, that does not mean you won't hear about it again. Anybody ever told somebody they were sorry? Anybody ever apologized? None of y'all would. Y'all need to. If you have apologized to somebody, you realize you were wrong. You went to that person and you said, I'm sorry. I should have never done that again. And they may say, I forgive you. But when the next argument comes up, here they come again. Remember what you did me? But I apologize for that. I ain't forget about it. See, Satan accuses us. Y'all with me? While the Holy Spirit convicts us. A lot of folk won't come to church because they say, I feel sad when I come to church. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is trying to help you and pull you away from your sin so your heart feels convicted he's not accusing you while Satan is trying to tear you down God is trying to build you up I hope y'all hear me this morning so first accused sin already confessed look at 1 John 1 and 7 you need to understand the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from what church all say it louder you cleanse from all sin I don't care if your husband bring it back up I don't care if your friends remind you of how you used to be you've been cleansed once you truly confess say the same thing look at our uh, second uh, makes you feel guilty for no reason first John 1 and 9 if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you. Tell your neighbor, I've been forgiven. It doesn't matter what has happened in your past. If you agree with God that that thing was wrong and you need to repent from it, it's over. It's behind you now. You don't need to keep bringing it up or feeling bad about it. You leave it in the past. But your friends won't do that for you now. The Holy Spirit's conviction. Note number four. Do y'all have that on there? I don't know what's on there. The Holy Spirit will remind you of the word of God. And convict your heart causing you. Prying you. Pushing you. Telling you. Begging you, confess. Agree with me. This thing is going to kill 
know you. I don't care how good it makes you feel. It's killing you. Listen to me. The scripture says when you come before the table, you got to come right. And it says for this reason, some of you are asleep. Now, I wasn't talking about sleep like some of y'all doing right now during the sermon. It's talking about dead sleep. Don't come before this table. This was a heavy price he paid for your sin to free you from sin. So you need to agree with God that what I am doing is not pleasing in his sight. The Holy Spirit, number four, confess your sins, right? Our spiritual bath, go to sea now, cleansing. What is this cleansing? It's a spiritual bath, not a physical bath. You can't go party all night, do all the bad things you want to do, go home, take a shower, come to church and praise the Lord. That you, you're still dirty. You need spiritual cleansing. Yes, sir. David said, wash me, purge me. Look at Isaiah 1 and 18. Though, this is God wanting to deal with you now, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. You did some terrible things, but I am able to make it white as snow, though they are red like crimson. Y'all hear me, church? They shall be as wool. You need to be cleansed. Not only that, you need to be, need to be consecrated. Set apart for the good of the Lord. Psalms 51, 12, 15, David says, Restore. Put me back where I'm supposed to be. Now, let me just talk to you as your pastor now. God's going to get you back where you're supposed to be if it kills you. I'm going to say it again. God will. I'm talking to believers. Now, if you're not a believer, go and take a nap. But this sermon ain't for you. Believers, listen to me. God will get you back where you're supposed to be if it kills you. If you have backslidden, if you've put other things before God, if, if God is not important to you like he used to be, don't worry. He has a way of getting you where you're supposed to be. David knew that. So David didn't pray to himself. Look what he says. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Look at uh, 14. It says, deliver me. I can't do it. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O oh God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips. And my mouth shall show forth your praise. So my brothers and sisters, you need to understand who you are as a believer. You are set apart. Let's just say I got 30 towels like this. Black towels, nothing special about them. Just a black towel, right? Let's say I got 30 of them. I take two of them to be my dust rags. Now, once you use a towel as your dust rag and put pledge and get all the dirt on it, you don't want to take a bath with that same towel. Do I have a witness? No, sir. These two towels are set apart. Everybody understand that? For my dusting. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? The other towels are used for bathing. Don't take my dust towel and take a bath with it. You as a believer are set apart from the rest of the world. 
You've been called out of the world and set and made special to God to do the will of God. Look at this. Adrian Rogers says this. When you are doing what you ought to be doing, y'all write this in. You cannot be doing what you ought not be doing. If you're in the right place where you're supposed to be, how many of you have heard he was in the wrong place? Come on, how many of y'all heard that? At the wrong time. Many parents can't believe that their child have died. What in the world was he doing uptown and we live in the east? If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you cannot do what you ought not be doing. If you're busy for the Lord, how many of you said the devil, uh, 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 an idle mind, come on now, is the what? If I'm busy doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I don't have time to get in trouble. So when we were growing up, parents made sure you didn't have time to get in trouble. Come on, do I have a witness in here? You wanted to get in trouble. Trouble was everywhere. It was all down the street. Trouble was going on, and you wanted to be in that trouble, but you just didn't have time. Because mama made a big long list starting at 6 a.m. in the morning all the way to 5 p.m. Do I have a few witnesses in here? And when you got done working from 6 a.m. to 5 p.m., your mind still wanted to get in trouble, but your body was too tired. I don't have no witness. Some of y'all need to get busy in the Lord, and you'll stay out of trouble. You'll stay out the courtroom. You'll stay out the jailhouse. You'll stay away from trouble if you get busy for the Lord. You've been consecrated. You've been called out of the world. You need to understand that the reason you find yourself in trouble is because you're in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. Do I have a witness in here? So let's, let's just do a little inventory. I got to get cleaned up. How can I get cleaned up? First, I got to put my confidence in the Lord. Yes, sir. I can't do it on my own. Y'all got that on y'all list? Yeah. Secondly, I might as well come clean with the Lord. Uh -huh. I might as well agree with the Lord and tell him who I am. I, I, I am that sinner. I've done nothing. I agree with you. Yes, sir. You are right and I'm wrong. Your word is true and I'm alive. I found out the hard way. That what you said, sure enough is. I got to confess it. Not admit it. Confess it. Second, I need him to clean me up. Cleanse my mind. Give me the right spirit. Work in me. Work on me. Do I have a witness in here? Help me, Lord, because I'm half crazy. Some, somebody say, half crazy, Rev. You all the way crazy. I'm all the way crazy. I need the Lord to work on me. I can't afford to miss Bible class. I'm too crazy for that. I can't afford to miss Sunday school. I don't have enough mind to miss it. I can't afford to go to sleep during the sermon. I'm crazy. I need to be here every time the door is open so I can get my mind right. Raise your hand if you need to get your mind right. Come on now. You know you need to get it right. You end up in trouble. You don't know how you end up in trouble because you're crazy. Tell your neighbor, you know you're crazy. Secondly, second, and lastly, lastly, consecrate me, Lord. Lord, you had me over here where I was supposed to be. My hard head itself went over here where you told me not to go. 
Now I'm in a world of trouble. Lord, save me. Pick me up. Turn me around. Put me back. How many of y'all glad you're back where you're supposed to be? Now the thing is, you got to stay here. You got to hold on to God with all you got. Because God wants to forgive me. And he wants to restore me. So we can complete the mission of Jesus Christ. What happens when a sinner, when a Christian sins? A whole lot happens. We need to understand who we are and whom we are. Tell your neighbor, I belong to the Lord and I got to live like I do. Let's stand on our feet. Somebody may want to come to the Lord right now.